Great, thank you. Uh, great, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm an investigator in the NIH, although I'm located in the Boston area. Uh, this is my first time to ISMB. I've been working in informatics for 10 years, so very happy to be here. Kind of feel like I'm among my people uh, for once. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a simplified schematic, but I think this is valid for how a lot of genetic studies operate. We're taking uh, either small number or nowadays many uh, genetic markers or SNPs, and then we're essentially doing association tests or correlations with an endpoint disease or quantitative trait, a biometric, or perhaps part of the transcriptome or part of the proteome. But this uh, is sort of missing the fuller context of uh, how the organism uh, functions and how diseases develop. And I think this audience is very familiar with some of the uh, different aspects of the genome, the epigenome, the transcriptome. All of these are extremely complex systems that uh, we're just starting to be able to have the technology to, to ascertain the quality data that we want and to understand some of the intricacies. So if we really want to understand how disease develops and the genetic contribution, we need to start to connect some of the dots uh, along the way, including the specific cell types and tissues that uh, lead our genetic variants to have an outcome. Um, and so one approach to do that is to try to collect essentially all the data that we can from the genetic literature, and uh, that's what this talk is about. It's essentially a resource talk. Um, this is a, on the x-axis just a timeline of the publications of genome-wide association studies, uh, and some people would mark about 2005 as being the first GWAS uh, science paper studying 100,000 uh, genetic markers in the genome for age-related age, uh, macular degeneration. Uh, I put it a little bit further back in 2002, a, a similar size study from a Japanese group. So nonetheless, you can see it was a, a very lo uh, long and slow uh, building in terms of the technology being able to ascertain variants and people take, uh, being able to afford to do this. Um, and then it sort of reached an exponential growth phase between 2007 to 2010, and now we're probably in a linear growth phase in these types of studies. Uh, the way we became interested in it was uh, at the Framingham Heart Study. We published uh, uh, 17 papers. Uh, there's nothing remarkable about these other than their little uh, blip on the curve back in 2007. But our results were going to be available to people uh, elsewhere in the world, so we started to think about how, how can we collect and pull other people's results to, to gain insights. And this led to what was essentially the first uh, open access GWAS results database in 2009. Uh, that study uh, only had 118 study, uh, studies in it at the time, so you can see there's a bit of a lag here, and that has to do with the time it takes to actually collect all these results and QC and annotate and, of course, publish. Um, so there were a number of insights to this paper. It was the first paper to sort of uh, report that GWAS, uh, significant GWAS findings were gene-centric. It was also the first paper to do sort of pathway and ontology analyses across uh, many, many studies. What I'm going to talk to you about today is sort of the next build, which is 1,400 studies. Um, I reference, a, a, there are a number of databases out there, but one that's often used is the NHGRI catalog, and so at the same time point, there's a difference of about 220 studies. Um, so we can, uh, a, a GWAS gives you points on the graph in the genome, uh, these Manhattan plots, if you're not familiar with, each of these is a genetic marker, so this is a minus log transformed uh, value, so the higher a point, the more significant the result. And you can see, uh, for instance, regions like this where you have a lot of correlated genetic markers associated with the disease. Um, and these are really, uh, in, for the first time in genetics, giving us unbiased uh, approaches to the genome versus, uh, say, candidate genes or linkage studies, which uh, didn't cover a lot of the genome, and shining the light for a disease or a trait. And so we can kind of think about uh, continuing to reload this, uh, this canon. Uh, some approaches are to just continue to increase the sample size to gain more statistical power, uh, to apply new technologies like exome chip and exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing approaches. And our group is uh, certainly engaged in some of these approaches, but I think we're reaching a saturation point in terms of what we're going to learn uh, through these uh, approaches and in discovering new genes. I think we need to think about how we can pivot to using uh, the large data sets we've already generated. So is a GWAS catalog needed? I think that's a somewhat redundant question. And I'll just point uh, to impact factor. Our 2009 paper has been pub uh, cited a, a 200 times or so. Um, the NHGRI catalog paper that came out at a similar time has been cited 1,800 times. 
um, in the last five years. So clearly people are using uh, these pooled data to make inferences. But how should we build it uh, compared to other catalogs? And then talk about some of the, the trends and the ways that we've been using the data and future directions. I just want to highlight, uh, we also have a separate uh, gene expression genetic EQTL database, which is a mixture of catalog, uh, catalog of public and private um, gene expression GWAS, and that was recently published in uh, BMC Genomics. Uh, that article covers about 50 different cell and tissue EQTLs. Uh, now the database is actually up to over 100. Um, so we find them to be quite useful as well as in, in, in interp interpreting uh, genetic results. But I'm going to talk uh, mainly just about GRASP today. Uh, the, the methodology, which I wish I could go into more detail, but essentially we have a, a controlled vocabulary uh, string search that we, we use in PubMed. We use Quosa uh, informatics software to, to facilitate the download of articles. And someone's reviewing essentially tens of thousands of abstracts to see if they meet our criteria uh, as GWAS. Uh, the, the, the massive effort here is really going into then all the materials from the articles, the supplemental materials, downloading uh, results files if, if they're available somewhere online, and extracting all of the genetic associations at a nominal p-value threshold of 0.05. Why do we choose this threshold? You can argue for more uh, lenient or more stringent thresholds. Um, some of the data that appears in these papers is actually targeted experiments. So they may have gone in and, and done a Western blot to measure a protein level in there. Uh, a genome-wide significant multiple testing threshold uh, may not be applicable. Um, there's a, a lot of quality control and annotation, the web development, and then, of course, everything is re-annotated to a common genome build since these papers are spanning many builds of the genome and many builds of the dbSNP, uh, common uh, gene sets, et cetera. So one question we probably should ask at the beginning is, will automated extraction approaches uh, work? I, I, uh, I'm not, perhaps not sophisticated enough, but I don't think so. So um, we extract the exact location of every result in the original paper, so that enables us to do at least a crude assessment of where uh, results lie. And at a, what we call a genome-wide significant threshold where you would take, uh, say, a million tests in the genome or a million LD blocks, uh, 0.5 divided by a million is five times 10 to the minus eight, and that's become an important threshold in the literature. Uh, excuse me. At that threshold, a lot of the associations are appearing in the main tables of the papers um, and the main text, so those might be easier to scrape. But the supplemental files, as you know, are quite heterogeneous in their file format and their, and their vocabulary, and that's really where, even at that level, many of the results appear. Uh, so there's an interface developed. It's uh, available. You can go there now. What is it? It's essentially uh, 6.25 million rows by about 80 columns, uh, a flat file. Um, you can download the whole database if you want and, and uh, integrate it with other resources you might have. You can go and you can look for particular disease or trait areas, uh, exercise a more stringent p-value filter to search for results, search uh, regions of the genome, gene names, uh, or, or SNP IDs, and find a lot about the methods there. Um, just comparing to one uh, catalog that's commonly used, the NHGRI catalog, there are some differences. Uh, we have a minimum genetic marker threshold of 25,000 markers for a study. We think there's still useful information potentially in this range from 25,000 to 100,000. The p-value threshold I already uh, pointed out. And uh, we're, we're continuing to work on updates. So we currently have data for about 2,000 studies, uh, and, and based on searches, there's probably more than 2,500. Um, this is not quite up to date, but the NHGRI catalog is also lagging behind just because of the time it takes to curate. And at the given uh, point in time I'm going to talk to you about, there's a, a difference of about 250 uh, GWAS, and, and we think, so we've actually looked at whether these studies met inclusion criteria uh, for us and for the other uh, catalog, and uh, about half of them are missed in the other catalogs. So we think this just has to do with um, string, string search terms. Uh, other important differences, we collect EQTLs, methylation QTLs, and metabolomics QTLs, so sort of high dimensional uh, genetic studies which are not included in the other catalog. Um, we will process full scans and record uh, the specific location of a result, which is nice when you need to go back to a result and kind of find the context and validate what it means. So go, uh, mo moving a little bit more to the interpretation. <clears throat> um, this graph shows you in, uh, sorry, in, um, 
in uh, green here is the, the MHC class two antigen presenting region of the genome and the, and the chromosome six. Um, and basically at, at a very stringent threshold, you can see a, a higher proportion of results are mapping to the MHC region. Um, so this is a very pleiotropic region that uh, contributes to a lot of diseases and traits. Uh, similarly, uh, you can see the EQTL findings that are uh, shown in red uh, and uh, other methylation QTL and metabolomics QTLs are enriched at a high level of significance. So if we look at the fold enrichment over the NHGRI catalog, essentially if we take out these uh, EQTLs, there's about 700,000 rows of the database, um, and if we take out the MHC region, which is rather atypical, uh, we still see at um, a genome-wide significant threshold about an 11-fold enrichment of results over the NHGRI catalog. I'm going to move quickly through the trends uh, in the studies, but essentially we assign phenotype categories. I think ontology is a really challenging area of bioinformatics, and we uh, definitely didn't do it any credit. Um, but we're glad to see in the Heart, Lung, Blood Institute that a lot, you know, at a genome-wide significant threshold, our diseases and traits make up a, a big fraction of the database, and that, that may be in part due to uh, large GWAS scans for traits, uh, risk factors like blood pressure. Um, obesity, et cetera. Uh, the next bin down, then, in terms of the number of uh, genome-wide significant results, uh, falls in the neurological area, and then uh, cancer, uh, with far fewer, an order of magnitude less results. So we could speculate on why this might be, uh, perhaps that um, germline contributions to cancer are not as much as somatic, um, but it could also be that uh, cancer researchers are disclosing less results, for instance. Quickly, some study trends. I think most of these are obvious to people who really um, read the literature, but um, in blue we have discovery sample sizes, in green replication sample sizes in studies, and if, over time, of course, as things grow cheaper, larger samples are accrued, um, the field has become more collaborative, and therefore we have larger and larger meta-analyses, but there's still quite a bit of a range there. Uh, one of the things we found surprising was the proportion of studies uh, in conducting imputation to fill in ungenotyped markers is actually not that high uh, through 2011. Only about a third of studies uh, have imputed, so we don't have common SNP studies, uh, SNP sets across most of the, the studies. Um, in the ethnogeographic uh, realm, this line here, which you can't really see the label, this is uh, studies including European ancestry studies. Um, the yellow line is then mixed studies that have multiple ancestries, and the green line is Asian. So what this shows us is that the growth in European ancestry studies is, is far surpassing other um, ethnogeographic boundaries, uh, and, and so I think this um, highlights opportunities for a lot more discovery if we can sample more diverse samples. You can also look at trivial things like uh, which journals are, are publishing GWAS studies over time. Um, maybe something worth thinking about if you want to know where to submit your paper. Um, but we're, sorry, how many? Um, so we're, we're really interested, one of the things we're interested in is identifying uh, variants or genes that uh, contribute to multiple diseases to gain insights into mechanisms. So we can simply sort uh, by the SNP markers that appear the most times. This is the one that appears the most times, uh, one that, where there's good functional evidence in a number of uh, systems. Um, and there are a number of interesting ones that, that we highlight in the paper. Another way to look at this, though, is to combine results at the gene level. So on the x-axis, we're showing um, each, each point is a gene. On the x-axis is the gene length of all, the, the combination of all the isoforms. And on the y-axis is the number of uh, GWAS results, in this case at a, a nominal p.05 threshold. Um, so you can see gene length is highly correlated with the number of results, and most of these are probably false positives, right? Um, but we can highlight some of the outliers that, that might be interesting. The first thing we notice is there's some genes that are depleted for associations, and these are X and Y uh, chromosome, uh, mainly. And that, the reason for that is that these aren't represented very well in genotyping arrays and uh, also have not been included in SNP imputation for the most part up until now. But we can highlight some, some nice highlighters, uh, outliers like the RBFOX1 gene, uh, which is associated with a range of neural uh, diseases. And in fact, we know that it's a neural-specific splicing factor that regulates many other genes, so it's a, an appealing candidate to be involved in multiple conditions and disorders. 
And uh, after the, the release of GRASP, then we, we go, went back to the literature and find even more uh, neural diseases associated with it, including uh, functional interactions with FOXP2, which is known to um, be involved in brain plasticity and language development. Um, some caution is warranted, though. Uh, another interesting outlier is this BNC2 gene. Um, it's associated with a range of traits, things like height uh, and skin color, freckles, which uh, vary from geographical region to uh, region. So this is, we think this is probably a, a human stratification locus for, for uh, some, some uh, traits. And in, in fact, there are coat, mouse coat color uh, and zebrafish models that show that the skin association is probably has a real biological uh, meaning, whereas the other associations may be false. <clears throat> We went on to look at how this gene length to uh, number of uh, trait associations decays as we uh, make the p-value threshold increasingly stringent. Uh, and that curve is shown here. Essentially, the, the correlation really begins to decay at a general threshold of about 10 to the minus 4. So we, uh, this is probably where uh, the prior uh, positive for uh, true, uh, true positive results really starts to go up. And at a genome-wide significant threshold, there's essentially no correlation between gene length and the number of uh, traits associated in a particular gene. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do is think about how we can deeply annotate and re-annotate GWAS results in, in a way that a lot of the researchers probably aren't thinking about. So just highlight a few things, um, non-coding RNAs, post-translational modifications, microRNAs and uh, microRNA binding sites as well as RNA editing sites are things that generally have not been incorporated into uh, annotation pipelines. Um, we can revisit the, the hypothesis that uh, associations are gene-centric, so this is showing the distance for a genetic marker to its nearest gene, either in the 5' prime or 3' prime direction, and again, the significance of the result for any trait. So you can see the high central tendency where more significant results tend to lump near genes. Um, but it's important to note if you look at uh, the mapping of markers, say, in an imputed SNP set, that they also tend to be fairly, fairly gene-centric. Um, so this enrichment is probably, you know, really in the genes and quite close to the genes. Let's give that. Um, going back and uh, annotating with non-coding RNAs, one of the examples we found that stuck out was a, a SNP associated in, uh, with prostate cancer in five different GWAS studies, quite significant. And when you look at those studies, they annotated the, the SNP as being in a gene desert or being uh, 70,000 bases from the nearest gene. Um, going back now and looking at non-coding RNAs, we see that it, in fact, uh, overlaps uh, to non-coding RNAs in a head-to-head -head confirmation, and there are encode features that uh, directly overlap the SNP in particular, so uh, perhaps a new functional hypothesis um, by re-annotating results. Another example that rose to the top in the RNA editing realm, this is a SNP that's associated with two brain movement-related disorders, progressive supranuclear palsy and Parkinson's disease. Um, again, quite significant in the GWAS. Um, researchers had uh, sequenced to try to find protein coding variants and were unable to find any. There was inconsistent evidence about whether EQTLs or splicing QTLs might contribute. Um, the nearby gene, MAP-T, T is definitely a, a brain-involved gene, um, but there are a number of high, you know, perfectly correlated genetic markers, and we noticed that one happened to overlap an A to I RNA editing site, in the, particularly in cerebellum in this uh, CRHR1 antisense gene. Uh, and this uh, particular uh, receptor, corticotropin releasing hormone, is also important in terms of brain function. Um, and, and further, this SNP uh, sits in an open reading frame and would cause a, an amino acid change. We went ahead and blasted this and found that it only matched to five other primate species. In all those species, the cysteine uh, sequence was present at that position, so perhaps uh, this this uh, amino acid is a, a human lineage specific um, a gene, and of course cerebellum is an important tissue for uh, movement. So a new functional hypothesis. I'm not a neurologist or a basic scientist, so I'm not going to do uh, more experiments on this. Um, a final area is looking for opportunities to either reposition drugs or gain new insights into disease. And one of the projects we have in review now, uh, a student with me, Liz Baskin. 
uh, took cardiometabolic and cancer uh, results in the database and tried to update the literature even further. Um, we know that these general disease domains share risk factors like smoking, diabetes, obesity, and low activity, and there's some evidence that treatments may impact both of them, such as aspirin, which has benefits in terms of colorectal cancer risk. Um, we updated the database to have uh, near over 400,000 results from about 450 papers and used a couple different approaches to look for shared loci between cancer and uh, cardiometabolic disease. We went on to look then in unpublished GWAS results where we find some evidence um, for shared loci as well as perhaps one new cancer locus, um, look at EQTLs in normal cancer tissue and review the biomarker literature. I'll just highlight one example that looks interesting to us. Uh, IKZF3 and LDA block in GWAS was associated with uh, type 1 diabetes and esophageal cancer. And it turns out that uh, another member of that transcription factor family is known to be upright regulated in CLL and also fusion gene and breast cancer cells. Um, further, GWAS have linked uh, a SNP in that uh, gene at a different chromosome with ALL and type 1 diabetes risk as well. Um, and two science papers earlier this year showed that thalidomides, uh, which have, uh, were you know, originally dis discontinued due to birth uh, defects, who are known to have uh, uh, treatment efficacy in multiple myeloma are in fact mechanistically linked to these, uh, these two genes. Um, so perhaps new therapeutic opportunities. Great. Okay, um, so I think it's important to acknowledge limitations in epidemiology. We think about that quite a bit. So there's obviously the limitations of the, uh, of the literature. I won't go into that anymore. Phenotype ontology is a very challenging area. Tissue availability in terms of EQTLs is still a, a huge uh, rate limiting factor, unfortunately. Um, we have issues of duplicated or correlated results uh, and or samples, in part because of uh, lookups of prior paper's results, and we try to filter those out. That takes a lot of work. Um, but we also have this problem where, say, a giant uh, a consortium uh, does GWAS for BMI, then it grows from 100,000 to 200,000 samples and repeats, and there's some overlap in samples, and we can't really disentangle that. Last thing is that we're often missing information about the actual modeled alleles in the direction of effect, and um, it's very hard to decipher, I'll just tell you that. Uh, the last slide, future directions, um, we have a mailing list and we're interested in just getting this out there for people to use in their own annotation. I know uh, several people have contacted me. I think somebody's working on a bioconductor package. Uh, we have a build 2.0 that we hope will release in fall or winter in about 2100 GWAS. Looking at sequencing-based studies, the, the truth is there aren't that many out there um, because of cost that have really attained large sample sizes. Um, so I don't think we're there yet in terms of utility. Um, we're trying to refine the search terms and uh, accepting people to deposit the results if they wish. And I just want to come back to this slide. I think it's the group of the bioinformaticists to really start to connect some of the dots between all of these pieces. I don't think it's going to come from uh, the clinicians and the basic sciences, although there are partners. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, in yellow all the people that have worked on this project. Um, Rick Leslie, who's now in medical school, did a lot of the actual data extraction, and this is the current team that's in bold that's working on updating the database. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, th thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I love this kind of reanalysis. I have a question about the gene length. Um, are you sure that um, it isn't just an effect of very, the, those outliers of uh, mark differences in marker density. So, like, if you just take the uh, like, how many times a gene is represented on. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we don't know exactly what was tested in every study, so that would be the ideal that we could model that um, because we don't have their post QC marker lists that they analyzed, right? But we did uh, address this in the paper, so you can take a look. Um, what we did was use a representative imputed data set and then go back to each gene calculate the number of SNPs tested in that representative sample and adjust for that, and it's very similar in terms of the, uh, the decay and the correlation with different thresholds if you account for SNPs. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, so you, you partially spoke to this when you started talking about your access to unpublished samples, mm -hmm. uh, but when you uh, mine very deeply like this, especially with the smaller trials, uh, in, in terms of the number of SNPs, can you estimate how much of an effect publication bias might be having on your overall data set? 
Um, it's not something I'd be interested in talking to you more about. It. It's not something we've really tried to systematically look at. Uh, and of course, if we look at some of the small studies, their odds ratios are sometimes astronomical in terms of the effects that they're predicting, which is expected. Um, so we haven't like filtered them out and, and repeated analysis. That's one thing we could try to do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so in cases where there's a lot of uncertainty or indetermination over what gene the SNP, um, like could be co what causal gene there could be, do you take the author reported genes? Um, do you do any any work no. to see the what plausible genes? Yeah, so we never take anything from the paper that the authors do. Um, we re, we've re-annotated everything ourselves. Um, and, and so in terms of uh, assessing causality, we generally do that more when we have a targeted project that is of interest to our collaborators or our group, but we often use EQTL data to try to narrow in. But even then, it's really tough to, uh, to work with EQTL data. You often see in a region multiple genes that have associations with the same variant, so you have to, you have to kind of scratch your head and think about that a bit. There's obviously the correlation, yeah. uh, genetic correlation and then uh, expression correlation within regions. So in the database, you um, report like the closest gene? Um, so in the database, we've done our own annotation. You'll get in the downloads, but NCBI is, um, as up to date, you know, so what you query through the, the interface will be the up to date NCBI annotations based on sort of the dbSNP models of um, closest gene. So you can kind of get ours or you can get the current. Um, you, have you done any work overlapping like associations? So multiple SNPs maybe tagging the same signal? Did you look at that at all? Uh, or can you browse by like overlapped associations? So you, uh, well, you can query by a SNP ID and then you get every, everything that came back. Is that okay. answer your question? Or, yeah. 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 Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks.